chapter 17. We're going to be reading a good portion of this chapter. And so if you'll follow with me, I'm going to read about 20 verses, and we're going to start at verse 15. And they that conducted Paul brought him in unto Athens, and receiving a commandment unto Silas and Timotheus, for to come to him with all speed, they departed. Now while Paul waited for them, that is, Silas and Timothy, at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him. And the word stirred means disturbed, um, agitated, aggravated, when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Therefore disputed he in the synagogues with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met with him. Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans, we're going to learn about them in just a moment, and of the Stoics, we'll learn about them, encountered him. And some said, what will this babbler say? Others, others some, he seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods, because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him unto Areopagus. Another name for Areopagus is what? Does anybody know? Mars Hill. This is Mars Hill. Saying, may we know what this new doctrine whereof thou speakest is? For thou bringest certain strange things to our ears. We would know, therefore, what these things mean. And a little quotation mark here. Dr. Luke can't help himself. The Spirit says, go ahead and put it down there. Quote, or, 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 or parenthetical, For all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear or some new thing. Um, so that's an enlightening thought. We'll see more about that. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, here's a sermon. You men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. Whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. God that made the world. And all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is, is, is worshipped with men's hands, as though he needed anything. Seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed, and the, and the bounds of their habitation. That they should seek the Lord, if happily they might feel after Him and find Him, though He be not far from every one of us. For in Him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of our own poets have said, for we are also His offspring. For as much then as we are offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone graven by art and man's devices. And the times of this ignorance, the second time that word is used, the time of this ignorance, God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance to all men in that he hath raised him from the dead. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. And others said, We'll hear thee again of this matter. So Paul departed from among them, howbeit certain men clave unto him and believed, among the which was Dionysius, the Areopagite, and, the wom and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. All right, now, just for the sake of context again, in Philippi, the people were aggravated, threw him in jail. In Thessalonica, they chased him out of town. And even in Berea, the citizens were unhappy and, uh, about the man of God and his preaching. So they forced him out of town again. But now, here in Athens, the tables are turned. He enters into a city 
that is not unhappy to hear something new. They're happy to hear something new. But as Paul waited on Paul and uh, Paul waited on Silas and Timothy to get there, he's the one that becomes aggravated. <laughs> he's upset. Um, he looks around and realizes that this whole city has is given holy. The Bible said there, W H O L L Y, to idols, to idolatry, and Paul's aggravated. Aggravated at the fact that though God can be known, this city was totally ignorant and turned away from that God. The word means uh, the word uh, stirred means to uh, to be disturbed, to be agitated, to be aggravated. Now, can I let you in on a little uh, something here? And I'll just be honest with you and straightforward with you. Uh, do you know that uh, folks that even preachers can get aggravated? My wife, she, she knows me and she knows how easy it is for me to get aggravated. I have to be real careful. I think I'm doing better these days, but earlier in my ministry, it wasn't so easy to control. Earlier in my ministry, I, I, I'd get aggravated as I was preaching. Maybe I saw somebody, you know, counting ceiling tiles, or maybe I saw somebody, you know, trimming their nails, and I'm trying to preach up here, and, you know, and I'd say, hey, what do you think you're doing? Listen up here right now. And all that kind of stuff, and sometimes I'd call people out. And anyway, but I'm, but but even preachers can can get aggravated, and there's really nothing wrong with that. Um, the Bible says, "Be ye angry and sin not. sin not." As long as you know, as long as I don't hit you in the head with a songbook, we'll be all right. <laughs> but 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 even preachers get aggravated, and, and of course, Brother Steve, you know exactly where I'm coming from here. You think about when, when, when I come to church, and I hope this is the same with you, but it can't be on the same level. Just, just let me understand. You understand? It can't be on the same level because I'm your pastor. But when I come to church, man, I, I mean, uh, all my focus is on what's going on here. Amen. You know what I mean? It just has to be. Um, I, I, can't, I can't get up uh, with, with half my mind thinking about what's for lunch or, or supper or, or thinking about the fight my wife and I had before church, I, I, I got I to gotta, I gotta refocus. I got to keep my whole focus on what's going on here. Amen. And, and so when I get up and do what I do, I expect the same from you. Amen. I don't know where it's coming from, but, you know, I'm just saying that sometimes it happens. And, and maybe, maybe I'm just being boring. I don't know. Uh, I like what... Uh, uh, there's a pulpit up in the Pacific Garden Mission up in Chicago. On the pulpit, it has these words. Um, if you don't strike oil in five minutes, stop boring. <laughs> anyway, uh, maybe you're just, you know, I didn't keep your attention. Maybe it's my fault. But if you'll come focused, if you'll come Amen. with your whole heart and mind in the middle, you learn something. Amen. But he got, he got in the city... And he's thinking about all these people with all these idols, and, and, and it just aggravated him to think that, that these people should have some capacity for the truth. Amen. You know? They should have some capacity to know God. I mean, if you're searching for God, you ought to know Him. God will allow you to know Him. But, but these people were just, uh, they were just, their life was full of idols. And uh, they worshiped, but they didn't know what they worshiped. Or they made up something to worship. Right. And again, man, we can see this all around us in our day too. Right. You see? And it aggravated him to see people in such a case. I'll be honest with you, I, I don't want to waste your time. I don't want to waste my time or God's time. So when we come together, you know, maybe we don't spend, maybe we need to spend more time on singing. I'm, I like singing. That's fine and all. and well, That's good. But, but that's not the main course. Amen. That's right. Amen. You know? Um, we could spend more time fellowshipping. And boy, you folks, when we fellowship on Sunday morning, it, it's hard to get you back together. But that's okay. I'm glad you like that. That's wonderful. But, I, but I'm just saying, you know, I, we can do a lot of things, but let's, let's don't waste the time we have to learn something from the Word of God because that's eternal. Amen. 
You know, me slapping you on the back, you slapping me on the back, all that's going to come and go. But this word's eternal, and I need this word. Right. You need this word. Yeah. And so when you come to church, man, get in there and get focused. Uh, don't let your mind be off thinking about something else. Because can I tell you something? If you are thinking about something else, that thing could very well be an idol. It's true. Yeah. If you're thinking about food, that could be your idol. Amen. If you think about, boy, I could be out. If you think I could be in my yard today working, that might, your yard might be an idol. <laughs> I could be working and making money today. That money might be an idol, huh? I mean, listen, you, you, anything that you put before God, if it's between you and God, it's an idol. So this city was full of that. It was aggravating Paul about it because he, these people should have known better than that. You're seeking God, you don't know. Here's a, here's an altar. And, and it says to the unknown God. And so Paul said, uh, here's my message. to the un- I'm going to tell these people who this unknown God is. But why did God, the question I want to answer tonight is this. Why did Paul get aggravated? What was going on that aggravated Paul so much, stirred him so much? And so I've got three words I want to give you tonight, and we'll talk about each one of them. First of all, ignorance. Ignorance disturbed Paul. Ignorance. It disturbed him. It, it stirred him up to think that people are ignorant. Can I tell you something? And I don't mean, God forbid me using this, this word, but we're all adults. Stupid people. I'm not talking about stupid people. Um, I'm not even talking about foolish people necessarily. I'm talking about people that are just ignorant. And, and not just ignorant, but willfully ignorant. Yeah. Right, right. This is a big difference. But it stirred him up. It stirred him up that and you think about America this morning. We got churches all over the place. There are churches everywhere. You can walk from church to church in our city almost. You can walk from here to Fairway. You can walk from there over to uh, to Church of Christ. You can walk from there over to uh, to the Methodist Church. You can, I mean, you just you could walk to every one of them if you wanted to. Okay, and that's what people do. They shop till they drop. And uh, they're just, they're just uh, like a bunch of grasshoppers just hopping from here to there to yon and hoping maybe when they land that everybody will treat them right and they'll feel good about themselves. And, but the church is far more than that. Church is a place that you go, first of all, you want to know, you want to know it's the will of God. That's right. But once you get in there, learn. Amen. Don't be ignorant. Amen. Learn, learn. That's why the Bible says study to show thyself approved unto God. Now, so... Paul was stirred by this overriding ignorance of the people concerning the true God. Now, I just made mention of this, but two times the word ignorance is used. Verse 23 and verse 30, and both of them have a little bit of a different meaning. Both of them have their own individual meaning. Let me share with you. Verse 23, look at it again. He said, For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship." Him declare I unto you. The, the, you think about this. The Athenians were smart. This this town has a bit, lot of history. It was a it was a, a great Greek city at one time, and and uh, and and so the Athenians were smart. They were educated. That you might even say they were sincere, but they were totally ignorant of the true God. So they made up gods. I like what one preacher said, and I was listening to the message. message. He said these words that man is incurably religious. Oh, right. boy, that's good. That's good. Man is, men are incurably religious. What does that mean? They, they just, they can't help themselves. If they don't have a God, they're going to make up a God. They're going to find something to worship. Yeah, that's right. Something. And so Athens represented that completely. Historians tell us that in Athens, it was easier to find a God than to find a man. That's what historians would say. It's easier to find a God than to find a man. They say the city had over 30,000 altars. Wow. Wow, that's a lot of altars. That's a lot of shrines. Every, one, every kind of God they could think of, and, and every one of them was a figment, listen, of someone's imagination. Yeah. Now, let me give you a little something here to think on. What's the first commandment? 
Thou shalt have no other God before me. That's in Exodus 20, I think, verse 3. What's the second commandment? Thou shalt not make any, any, graven, images. any, any graven images. Mm -hmm. The word image, the root word for imagination. Mm -hmm. Okay? And so the, these Athenians, they didn't know the true God, and so they were imagining a God, and they created gods by their imagination. Man, thank God as a Christian, we worship the God of the revelation, not some God of our imagination. Amen. That's right. And so they, they imagine. You, know you know why folks do that? Because they want a God to their liking. That's right. They want a God to be like, right. I, I, I want my God to be like me. Yeah. You see. History tells us that Athens had more philosophers and teachers and educators than any other city in the world. They studied religion, but they still didn't know God. They wanted to put God in a box. Everybody had a box. Maybe two or three. This is my God that I worship for the outside. This is, what the, this is the God I worship on the inside. This, this is the God I worship for this reason or that reason. And so what they're doing is coming up, God, coming up with gods of their imagination. They are imagined gods. Graven images. Take a God, I'll draw you a picture. This is what my God looks like. They put him in a box. They draw him out. They, they make him in stone. Um, they worship it. You see that all around us. Now, I wrote this because I was in a mood today, and so I'll just read it. <laughs> we imagine God to be a cowboy, so we build cowboy churches. We imagine God to be a hippie, so we build hippie churches. We imagine God to be a revolutionary, so we build rebel churches. We imagine God to be a biker, so we build motorcycle churches. And so you have all these different kinds of churches. I thought it was kind of funny when I wrote it. But, <laughs> but why do we do that? Because we want God to be like us. That's right. Yeah. Instead of us becoming like God. Amen. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. So... So these, this, this great big, this hippie movement, you know, there's a movie out, uh, Greg Laurie or somebody got this movie out about, the, about Jesus being a revolutionary, and, and there's just a lot of junk in there. And I, I kind of lived a little bit of that, but I'm telling you, my friend, um, Jesus was not a hippie. No, that's right. All right? Uh, he was not a revolutionary. If anything, he was a counter-revolutionary. Does that make sense? He didn't revolt against us. We revolted against him. He's trying to bring us back. Um, and Jesus wasn't a cowboy, and he wasn't a motorcycle biker. He, he was who he was. He was the Son of God. And so we, won't, we, don't, we don't have to imagine God in any text except for this text right here. He is the God who created the heaven and the earth. Amen. He's a Amen. friend that sticketh closer than a brother. Amen. We don't have to draw him out. We don't have to put him in a box. Amen. Let God be God and every man a liar. You see what I'm saying? But that's where idolatry comes from. Everybody wants a God that they can relate to, you know. And then the second part of that ignorance, not just the unknown ignorance, there is this willful ignorance that's a real problem. I know, but I'm not willing to, to, to recognize it. I know, but I revolt against it. I know the truth, but, but I won't accept it, you see. I, I'm willfully... The word ignorance, what's, what's the root word of ignorance? Ignore. ignore. I, I know the truth, but I ignore it. I'm willfully ignorant. I don't want to know it. You know what makes me, sometimes I tell my wife stuff like this, she said, where do you get this stuff? But I think about it, I see some long-haired guy on television preaching the gospel or preaching whatever. He's a life coach. That's all he is. He's preaching to a bunch of hippies. He's got long hair. Or maybe somebody's up there leading us some kind of song service and they got this long hair. And I tell my wife, don't these people have a Bible? <laughs> First Corinthians eleven fourteen, or Second Corinthians eleven fourteen, one of them. Doth not even nature itself teach you if a man have long hair, it's a shame unto him. That's right. Now we can debate all day long what long is. But if I can't tell what you are from the backside, we got a problem. Amen. That's right. Amen. From the backside, I passed somebody on a horse one time. They had long hair. I thought it was a girl, and I turned back, and it was a boy. 
But but don't they have a Bible? They, here's what they do. Oh, I heard that verse. I, I know that verse is in there, but you know, I just choose to ignore it. That doesn't that doesn't mean me. Have mercy. The Bible may not all have been written to me, but it's all for me. Amen. And that's a New Testament verse. So you just figure out how long long it is and go from there. But but if it's long enough to, that you can't tell what you are. Right. By the way, in this day and age, in the woke business, we ought to be concerned about that. Amen. Amen. I ain't trans in nothing. Amen. Okay. <laughs> okay, so they're willingly ignorant. This upset Paul. This stirred him. So what's Paul's answer? He's going to preach. That's right. He's going to preach. Whether the audience likes it or not, he's getting up to preach. Amen. And that's what he did. Amen. Second thing I think that stirred him, not just the ignorance issue, but the arrogance. Yeah. Just the just a plain old prideful arrogance. Look at verse 18. Then certain... These were well-known, certain. When you hear the word certain, that's somebody. They people, this is somebody. Philosophers of the, first of all, Epicureans, and of the Stoics encountered it. And then down in verse 20, 21 is the word Athenians. Oh, look at those three words, the Epicureans, the Stoics, and the Athenians. You talk about arrogance. First of all, think about these folks, the Epicureans. If you've ever done a study on this, or maybe you just know because you're smart, but I have to study this stuff out. The Epicureans, uh, it, was a, it was a philosophy based on the teachings of a man named Epicurus. It, it was started around 300 before Christ, 307 B.C. Here's what it teaches. That man's greatest goal and good is to seek out physical pleasures and sensations and creature comforts. That's, that's what an Epicurean is. I mean, um, they, they live for, for the pleasure, for the moment, for the experience, for the sensation. That's Epicureanism. They thought this is all that life was about. I call them the extravagant Epicureans. Amen. Boy, everything's, everything's uh, uh, you know, uh, fun and, and life is... Uh, a uh, barrel of monkeys. I don't know where that came from. But he was just going to do what I want to do and have fun. And ain't nobody going to tell me different. And they want to argue with Paul. And they were arrogant about it. Yeah. There's a second group also called the Stoics. Verse 18. Stoicism, Stoicism is a school of philosophy that originated in Athens in about 300 B.C. It emphasized the importance of living a virtuous, rational and, dis and disciplined life. It was absent of pleasure, absent of sensation, absent of creature comforts. It was just like um, you get sick, that's reality, you just suck it up and, and God doesn't care and you, you should just live a stoic life. You, the word stoic is something we still use today. Uh, I call these men the sad sack stoics, you know. Uh, they just, you know, and they want to argue about it, but they're arrogant about what they believe. Then you have the, the Athenians coming in on the group. And what does the Bible tell you about them there in verse number 21? For the, all the Athenians and strangers, uh, they spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. Okay? These are the all-knowing Athenians. So you have the Epicureans on one end of the spectrum. You have the Stoics on the other end of the spectrum. You have the Athenians that think they know everything. And bottom line is, all three of those groups are just ate up with pride. This plain of arrogance. They won't humble themselves before the mighty hand of God. God resisted the proud. That's right. That's right. He gives grace to the humble. That's right. They're not going to ever be saved as long as they got pride around their neck. You know the number one killer of, of, of people today, Christians and 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 even and those who are who are out there that need the Lord and they won't ever accept the Lord. They're just too much pride. You know what I say this too, might as well. There are times when I preach and I think, you know, maybe about half this congregation ought to be at the altar, but you're not because of pride. Yeah. Hello. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to be mean tonight. 
But it's true sometimes, isn't it? You know, I mean, honest, sometimes, you know, you heard something, you know it's the truth, you probably, well, I can just stand here. But having to walk out in front of people, I tell people to close their eyes. That's right. If they're peeking and they saw you, I'm going to be upset with you. But what does it matter who's looking? Amen. If right. God sees there's a need in my life and I need to get with God, and I might need to go to that altar if for no other reason but just to humble myself Amen. before God. That's right. You know? Amen. Oh, well, that's, that's, that's important. Amen. These guys were arrogant. And that's what kept them from knowing God. And that just, that stirred, that stirred Paul's heart. He was stirred in his spirit about that. And number three, I think he was stirred because of reluctance. Not just ignorance and arrogance, but reluctance. Look at verse 32. After Paul preached his heart out, after he said all he could say to get these people saved, after he did all he could do to introduce them to Jesus, he mentions the resurrection of the dead, and all of a sudden, boom, when they heard that, verse 32, some mocked. Now think about this. Don't just read it. Think about it. What'd you say? Somebody got raised from the dead. What? What? Come on, Paul. you kidding us. This is crazy. Nobody comes out of the grave. They mocking him. Paul thinks people can live again. Mock, mock, mock. <laughs> and others said, don't call me, I'll call you. Oh, we'll hear the again of this matter. We'll, oh, we might talk to you later about it. They, they don't have any intention at all. They're just, they're just reluctant to accept it. They're procrastinating. Amen. They're just putting it off, putting it off, putting it off. You remember when Paul stood before, was it Felix or Pilate? I forget when they went through it. He said, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Was that right. Felix, I believe? And, and Paul said, I wish you were as I am without the bonds. I, I wish you were. Almost thou persuadest me. And a lot of them were just like, almost, I'm almost getting it, but, but I'm just going to procrastinate and wait. Maybe, maybe I'll come back to this later. Most people don't. I love that song, Miss Jackie. Uh, Brother Robert, you know, Almost Persuaded. I love that song. Wish I had it. You could look it up sometime. Almost Persuaded, yet lost. Um, and the fact is, that's where a lot of people are today. So Paul, so Paul's just, he's, he's aggravated by the whole thing. Now, but thank God, even in the midst of all that, there were some that got saved. And this is the optimistic part. This is the good part of this story. It says that Paul in verse 33, after they mocked, after they said, I oh, will get back to you. It says that uh, he, he departed from among them. He said, okay, I'm done. And he leaves. But he had some converts. Thank God. One was a man named Dionysius the Areopagite. Do you see that in your book, in your Bible? Verse number 34, how be it certain men clay. One of those was Dionysius, the Areopagite. Uh, there was a group of people in Athens called the Areopagus. And uh, it was, a, it was a, uh, a, a board of uh, judges. Okay? It was like the Supreme Court of Athens. Uh, kind of like the Sanhedrin of the Jews. And there, I don't know how many were sent on it. But, but these judges were very important people. And, and they would uh, rule uh, there from Mars Hill. People would come and they would, they would make decisions for the people. It was like a Supreme Court. He was a well-known figure there in Athens. So well-known that Luke said, hey, guess who got saved? Dionysus of the Areopagus. He got saved of the Council of Judges. Paul, uh, that, was, that was a trophy. And, uh, but, but he received the Lord as his Savior. And you think about that. This man had prestige. He probably had fame and money. He probably could have done anything or spent the rest of his life doing whatever. Uh, but in his heart, he knew he was lost, going to hell, and he received Christ as his Savior. Yeah. And, he, and he clung on to Paul. Many believe that he became the first pastor of the church at Athens. Okay, he's the first bishop of the church at Athens. And um, 
History also tells us that uh, uh, he would eventually uh, die a martyr's death. He had his head severed from his body under the rule of the emperor Domitian for his faith in Christ. According to Fox's Book of Martyrs, which I have in my office, I looked it up, he was killed about the same time as Nicodemus and Timothy around A.D. 97. So he was willing to follow the Lord to the very end, was, was beheaded for his faith. There's another name mentioned here. It is the name Damaris or Damaris, a woman named Damaris. Now, what about her? Evidently, a well-known woman in Athens. Now, here's the tricky part about Damaris. We don't know anything, really. Um, there's a lot of speculation. Some speculate that she might have been Dionysus' wife. We don't know. If, if she was, why didn't they say so? The Bible could have easily said in his wife, you know, but, but it doesn't. Many believe that she was a temple prostitute, which would have been, you know, there was a lot of those in, in Athens. Maybe that was the case. But either way, this, this well-known woman had a remarkable conversion. <laughs> this famous, whether she was famous or infamous, she was known. And Luke said, and guess who else got saved, people? <laughs> Damaris. And I'm sure as others in the churches read this, they said, Damaris got saved? Yes, she got saved too. And uh, which is, which is a, I, I want to say that she was probably from the other end of the spectrum. You got the rich and famous got saved, and you had the poor and outer that got saved too. And, uh, and she came to know the Lord as her Savior. Now here's what we're going to say in conclusion. It seems that the church at Athens never really flourished as did many of the churches Paul planted we know he wrote a book to Corinth he wrote a book to Thessalonica and other cities that had churches but he never wrote a, an epistle to the Athenians also Paul only visited Athens once that one time he came through he never went back again he never went through there again as far as we know so we can assume that Athens was not, at least in Paul's opinion, fertile ground. There was too much education, too much pride, too much arrogance, too much reluctance. People just wasn't listening. They were, they were just turning them off. And so probably Paul did what Jesus taught the disciples to do. Just wipe the dust off your feet and go on. You know? Don't wipe the dust off of the church, obviously. There was a good church there. But, uh, but sometimes there's just groups of people you can't minister to. They won't be ministered to. All you can do is leave them with the truth and hope that it registers right. somewhere, somehow. Amen. Right. Amen. Father, we love you tonight.